Neil Diamond, one of the world's biggest selling pop stars, he's more commonly known as a superstar, is, despite his world renown, a man we know little about. The reason for that is simple. Neil Diamond has never given a television interview, except at occasional press conferences. Never has Neil Diamond actually talked about himself. I've been given the privilege of conducting this exclusive interview with a man who is making show business history, a man who gave up singing for three years because he wanted to find himself. He wanted to be more than just a complete songwriter or complete performer. He wanted to be a complete person and a complete father. 35 years old, he's a multimillionaire. One record album of his, Hot August Night, made record-selling history in Australia. You'll find a copy of it in one out of every four Australian homes. Tonight, let's meet Neil Diamond, the songwriter, the artist, the superstar, and the solitary man. Melinda was mine till the time that I found her. Holding Jim, loving him. You came along, loved me strong That's what I thought Me and you But that died too Don't know that I will But until I can find me Look at the stay And won't play games behind me I am a solitary man, a solitary man. It sure looks like me. Neil Diamond, welcome yes. and thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Are you a solitary man? I suppose that I am, but uh, probably no more than most other people. You know, when you're uh, when you're exposed to the public, when you're put in the public's eye, you uh, you're confronted with pressures and uh, situations that. Uh, um, that the uh, the average person doesn't uh, really experience, and so uh, uh, like just every other person around the world, I, I seek out my time for myself and uh, for the things that I consider uh, important above and beyond what I do, uh, the work that I do. Do you like making friends? Um, oh, that's I like friends, friends, but friends are rare. I think if. Over a lifetime, if I have three or four friends, I'd be very happy. Yes, you, do you, you don't have many close friends, in other words? Uh, I have many friends. I have a few close friends. Do you, when you meet people, do you want to keep contact with them, or do you say, hello, nice to meet you, and that's it? Well, there are, there are people that you want to have contact with, that you want to have continuing relations, uh, relationships with, because they're either interesting or there's something compatible about them that's... Uh, that's that makes you feel good for many reasons, but... Uh, You've had three years now to find yourself. What did you achieve during those three years? Well, I think the most important thing I achieved was the ability to, um, to, um, I guess, develop, I, I developed an ability to, uh, to remove myself from the arena. You know, before then I was, I was always in the arena, whether I was on stage or not. Uh, I was always in the arena in psychologically my mind was there and um, being away for this period of time having the chance to learn to develop a taste for relaxation and for to remove myself and I've, I've, it was one of the high points of the last three years the ability to relax and remove myself from from the extraordinary uh, um, situation that I got into in the first place which is the public arena yeah, was it a hard decision for you to make to say, right, I'm going to risk leaving everything for a couple of years and hope that I can be accepted back again? It wasn't very hard at all. I, I'd wanted to do it for about two years prior to the time that I had done it. And uh, the year before I did my final tour, I had decided that this would be my last tour for a while. I, I felt that there were important things that I had to do, and it was a very easy decision to make, and I, I looked forward to it. Will you need to do this again uh, periodically? Oh, yes. I think it's important. I think it's important not only for me, but for anybody who finds himself in a kind of work that, um, that um, puts you under extraordinary pressure. 
uh, I think it's important to remove yourself, to to uh, to find yourself again, to replenish the uh, uh, all of those juices that make people go and make them function and make them productive. Yes, I want to take sabbaticals periodically. I think it's important. You've said that you need to be a complete person, and this is why you're doing this. Can you be a complete person while you're a superstar? Well, you know, superstar is, uh, is an invention. That, uh, that word is an invention, and uh, it doesn't really relate to me. It may relate to the press or to the record companies. It doesn't relate to what I am as a person. Um, you, don't yes. think, you don't think that you're, uh, because you've reached this and because other people are calling you that, that it has an effect on you? Um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't have very much of an effect on me. Uh, I'm motivated, and uh, I, I get my joys from, from the work that I do. Uh, frankly, I can't deal with the enormity of this uh, success and acceptance. Uh, um, and so I don't deal with it. I deal with my work, and whatever happens beyond that is the fates, you know. So when people react the way they do t towards you and what you read about yourself and see about yourself, you try and disconnect that from the real you. That's right. I, I do that. I have to do that. Do you care about what the people think oh, about yes, you? Oh, yes. Of course. Um, absolutely. But well, um, I, I care more about what they think of my work than what they think of me or... Um, well, I want them to like me. I mean, anybody who puts themselves in front of the public wants to be accepted and to be liked. But uh, I would hope that at some point I would be able to be accepted just on the nature of my work and the quality of my work. Well, we talked to a few people at one of your shows and to get some reaction of what they really think of you. Okay. And I think we might just have a look and see what they say and let you hear it. What does Neil Diamond mean to you? Oh, terrific. <laughs> oh, <he's> terrific. <laughs> Great. This is the best show I've ever seen on Earth. Do you think of him as a superstar or as a person himself? As a person more than anything. Just a good songwriter. But as a person, what sort of person is he? Um, moody, very, um, he's deep, yeah. A lot of meaning behind what he writes, and that brings out his personality. Oh, he's a singer, he's a good entertainer. That's all. Do you ever think about his personal identity, what sort of a person he is? Not particularly. I don't pry into people's private lives. When you listen to his music, do you think of him as a person, or just as a superstar, or what? Probably a superstar, I suppose. Do you ever stop to think about him as a person? In his own right? No, not really. As a superstar, it's greatest. Do you ever stop to think about him as a person? Not really, no. What do you think of him as a man? Beautiful. <laughs> do you think of him as a man, though? Yes. yes. What sort of a man is he, though? Beautiful man. Just an Too late. No different than any other man. He's got a good voice. It's more a personality, I think, than a man. What sort of a man is he? What makes him tick? I don't know. Just his music, I think. Do you care about him as a man? Not really. Just his music? Just his music, yeah. I don't think him in those terms. And what sort of terms do you think of him in? Just his music. I enjoy his music. You don't care about him as a personality at, at all? No, I don't think that at all. Well, is that the sort of reaction you would have expected or hoped for? Uh, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's very interesting because I've never really... Uh, I've never really uh, seen people who've reacted uh, after a show or during a show. It's very rare that you have a chance to sit down with people, and uh, it's it's uh, it's embarrassing to ask someone what you know. I can't do it, but that's interesting. Uh, yes, I I would differ with one of the girls who spoke and said, no, I don't really think of him as a person, just his music. And the reality is that uh, uh, if they're familiar with my music, then they're familiar with me because the music is a really a direct reflection of what I am as a person. And uh, I like some of the reactions in the respect that uh, some of those people uh, seem to relate to uh, 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 or didn't want to relate to me as a, as a superstar or a celebrity. I think it's very important to diffuse the myth because in reality I am just a, a man like any other man. I, I happen to write music and songs and I've been lucky enough to have a great deal of acceptance, but uh, I'm not talking about anything in my music that any other human being on this earth has not felt or, or cannot feel. Are you moody? I used to be very moody. Uh, I've learned to deal with it. Um, I've come out of myself a great deal in the last three and a half years. Uh, uh, I like myself better. 
and uh, I'm not nearly as moody as I was. Why did you decide to give this interview when you haven't done so before? Uh, well, I first I felt that it was very important after seeing the, uh, the kind of press that was coming out when, when I got here that, um, that the Australian audience get a chance to, uh, to see beyond uh, that celebrity uh, kind of a thing, you know, the front page of newspapers all the time, and then realize that there actually was a human being behind that. Uh, I don't think it's productive to represent a person purely on the basis of superstar celebrity. It's not real. It's not, uh, you're not seeing a person. And uh, I felt that there was another side and uh, that it might, uh, it might be good if people got to, uh, uh, got some insight into the other side of the Neil Diamond. And why don't you do it more frequently? Why haven't you done it before? <clears throat> well, I don't do it uh, for many reasons. First of all, because it's primarily not what I do. I'm a writer. I'm a performer. Uh, if you wanted to, if you permitted it, then you would. I could do interviews from morning until night, every day of the year. Uh, it's, it takes your energy. It's not the primary thing. It's, uh, you know, I'm fond of saying that uh, my father told me when I was a, when I was a boy. He said, Neil, <clears throat> I want you to always remember this. He said, Keep your eye on the donut and not on the hole. And uh, and the stage and the writing and the performing and the recordings. That's the donut. And I don't want to take the analogy any further. This is not the whole, but it's, it's, it's less important. And so I, I, I don't do it. You like to communicate with people, don't you? Yes, uh, yes. In fact, even with an audience of 20, 30,000? Sure. Do you try and communicate with them almost individually? <laughs> well, I see an audience more as an individual. I don't see it in numbers. It doesn't matter. Once you get past 1,000 people, you cannot deal with them. Uh, you know, in terms of numbers, it's one person, whether it's 40,000 people or, uh, you know, 5,000 people, it's one person that I'm relating to. Well, I watched you communicate doing a, a song, Song Sung Blue, and I'd like you to watch yourself communicating uh -oh. as we can in this <laughs> okay. very short piece of film. Funny thing, but you can't see it with a cry in your voice. Stop the feeling good, you simply got no choice. So, so, everybody knows. We have a wonderful opportunity here tonight, and that is to create the largest choir known in the history of man. The first Sydney all mixed choir, 38,000 voices strong. Dare you sing with me? Will you sing it with me? All right. Do you enjoy performing that? <clears throat> that song? Yeah. Well, you see, that song gives me an opportunity to, uh, to put myself in a very scary position because it's one of the exciting things about doing a concert is the unpredictability of any given moment. And I, I, that, to me, is the great fear and the great excitement. It's the charge that I get out of uh, performing. Uh, the audience gets the music, and I get the spaces in between the music, you know, which are unpredictable, and I like to let things happen. So this song in particular gives me the opportunity to, to um, not only relate to that particular audience, but also to let things happen that would not uh, happen anywhere else, but at that moment, in that air, in that audience. Um, and for that reason, for the fear of it, you know, <clears throat> it's the man who climbs Mount Everest and looks down, you know. Uh, but it's also enormously exhilarating and exciting, especially when something exciting happens. What was the inspiration behind that particular song? Well, you know, inspiration is a large word. Whenever I think of inspiration, I see it with a capital I. Uh, and it's a, it's a, I've only had inspirations in my life maybe three times or four times, the kind of inspiration when you felt your heart pounding and, you know, just life rushing through your veins. But uh, the song was... Um, I remember listening to a, to a Mozart piano piece uh, recording and I was very, very attracted by a part of the melody. And uh, it stuck in my mind and I found myself writing a song the next day that where the first two melodic phrases were very similar. And I took it my own direction and took it my own way after that. But I suppose that that Mozart piece, in Piano Concerto 21, was the, uh, the starting spark for that song. Where and when do you write best? Well, writing um, 
best happens when it needs to happen. Writing comes at the least predictable moments. Uh, I've written some of my best songs in the back of cars, in buses, in hotel rooms. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite unpredictable. If you <clears throat> are told to write something, can you? Yes. Is that difficult? Um, when it doesn't want to come, it's very difficult. Uh, I can write something when I have to write something, uh, but you, it, it's, not always, uh, it's not always that very special thing. I much prefer to write when it comes and to leave myself open and to leave my schedule open so that when I feel like writing, everything else ceases because writing is first for me. All my appointments are cancelled. My, you know, I lock the doors because, and it's a good feeling too. It's a very up, up feeling. So when I feel like writing, everything else stops. I write. You work hard to perform. Do you have to keep fit for that? You do have to keep fit for performing. But I find the best way to uh, to get fit is to actually go out and perform. And it's very difficult the first uh, few times that you do it. I remember we did some some concerts in Sacramento and California when we first started in preparation for this tour. And when I got off the stage the first day, and I hadn't been on stage for th was three and a half years, my body hurt. I felt that I had been in a prize fight for 10 rounds against Cassius Clay. You know, it was my kidneys, my you know stomach muscles, everything hurt. You know, I had used muscles that I haven't uh, used in years. But now, uh, now I'm accustomed to it, and I, I feel as though I'm getting stronger each time I do it. Do you do much else? Do you play sport? Not really. Uh, I'm not very much of a sportsman. Uh, uh, I prefer to sit and read or think or write. And, um, I was lucky in Sydney because the hotel sent up a, a ping pong table in my room, and I, just anyone who happened to pass through, we played, and it, which is fantastic exercise, you know. Neil, are you nervous before a show? I'm a little nervous. I have butterflies and uh, doubts and all of those things, yes. Have those doubts ever come true? Have you had problems? Uh, there are, there are so the potential when you're performing for an audience, and of course the show is so complicated and intricate, there, the lighting and the sounds and the music and uh, everything has to work smoothly for it to work smoothly. So there are many, many places for things to go wrong. And so I just expect things to go wrong, and um, it doesn't bother me when they do. You haven't always had it easy, have you? No, I don't think I have it easy now. You don't think you have it no. easy now? No. At the times that you don't have it easy, do you, are you concerned about the future? Do you worry well, about when you happen? say easy, do you mean a show is not going well or my writing is not coming? Is that what you mean? I meant you and, and upbringing and, and wealth and the things that go with... Um, going through hard times, not just one particular show. Are you talking about financially? <laughs> yeah, use that as an example. Well, the most difficult times that I have are when my work isn't coming, when I'm not writing, when I'm not being productive. When I don't feel as though I'm functioning as a person because when I'm not writing, I have nothing to do. And um, those are the most difficult times. I find that the, f the money and the financial thing is fine, but at best what it can give you is... Uh, it can buy you privacy to a degree, which most people get for nothing, but uh, uh, it can do that. It can buy you material things. I've never really developed a taste for material things, so uh, um, no, the, the most productive and fulfilling times are when I'm working and am working well. I believe you were quick to throw a punch in your youth. No, actually I was very much quicker to duck from a punch. <coughs> we lived in uh, number of sections of Brooklyn that were uh, poor sections and uh, when you have uh, poor kids running around not very much to do they tend to get into uh, all kinds of trouble uh, I really wasn't part of that thing I had just passed through a number of neighborhoods where the prevailing sentiment was that uh, you know the gang uh, thing and it was um, and I did, uh, I became a, a member I was the youngest member of one gang and being the youngest and most fragile member. I, I didn't really um, get involved in anything with the rest of the guys, although I did in a number of gang fights, I did end up uh, carrying uh, weapons and things like that. It was uh, They didn't trust me. To, I was much too thin and uh, fragile. So I was the gopher for the group. What role has your childhood played in later life? 
Oh, well, it's, uh, you know, a childhood shapes you. You're, you're very, yes, you're like soft clay when you're a child in every respect. And uh, it, uh, there were many positive things that I got out of it. Um, my, uh, I started working when I was nine years old with my father. I worked every day after school, and I worked uh, every weekend in the farmer's markets around New York. I developed a very close relationship with my father because of it, and I also developed a, a, a love for work. You know, I understood it very early in my life, and uh, I came to uh, derive a satisfaction from it. At what stage did you realize that this was going to be your work? This work? Well, I suppose it was uh, back of my mind for quite a while. I remember when I was 10 or 11 years old, we had just moved back from Cheyenne, Wyoming. <clears throat> we moved out there and we lived out west for three or four years. And I was exposed to cowboys and uh, guitars and singing cowboys, which were my first heroes, you know. The, the, the cowboy who would sit on his beautiful white stallion and with his guitar and, and, and win the girl because of his beautiful song. Uh, and so I became afflicted with that thing while, while I was uh, in Wyoming. And we came back to New York, and uh, I remember even as a child, they had these advertisements in the back of uh, comic books, and I'd read them. If you sold this many Christmas cards, you would win a pair of skates or a guitar. And uh, The thing I always wanted was the guitar. You like writing poetry, don't you? <clears throat> I did write poetry, if you could call it poetry, when I was a teenager. But uh, I found it uh, that writing songs, which was, uh, I found it to be much more satisfying because the music uh, adds a dimension that uh, that purely words cannot even begin to touch. You know, music goes directly to the soul. Do you try and get a message across with your music, with the songs? Well, you are talking about something with every song that you write, whether it's an emotional state or a relationship or some fantasy. And, of course, the message is whatever that song is about. Yeah, do you try, though, and get a message across, or do you think really in terms of a bestseller? No, I have, I've never really thought about bestsellers while until the thing was finished. I could sit and listen to it and say... That seems to me to have potential as far as the public is concerned. But while you're doing it, no. Uh, I tried that for a long time. When I first started writing songs, I, I came into New York City and I started to knock on doors and, and try and get what I was writing at that time heard. Um, they didn't like it, obviously. I was a new writer and um, there were always suggestions. You know, we don't like this, we don't like that, change this. And I tried for a number of years, seven or eight years actually, to write <clears throat> what other people thought was what I should be writing. And I was very, very unsuccessful at it. It wasn't satisfying to me. And, uh, uh, you know, I, those songs fade from memory very quickly. It might be fair to say that you <clears throat> put your message forward in a fairly unusual sort of manner because sometimes the, the words are quite unusual. For example, uh, I am, I said, which is when I thought we might just have a listen to a couple of those words now while you're performing them. I'd like you to talk about it afterwards. It is fine, the sun shines most of the time. And the feeling is laid back. Palm trees grow and rents are low, but you know, keep thinking about making my way back. New York City born and raised But nowadays I'm lost between two shores LA's fine but it ain't home New York's home but it ain't mine no more I am a sin To no one there Not even the chair I am my cry 
And I can even say why Leaving me lonely still Do you feel confident you got a message across in that song? <clears throat> well, see, I, I'm not really aiming so much to get a message across as I am to express um, some particular emotion or feeling. Uh, uh, I think there is a message in that song. It's it's the, it's the story of of someone who's experiencing the kind of intense aloneness that, uh, that most of us have experienced at one point or other in their life. On the subject of loneliness, apparently you see, receive quite a bit of mail from people who have a loneliness. Yes, that's And communicate true. with you. Yes. How do you react to that? Well, obviously I, I identify with it, I sympathize with it. But I also understand at this point that um, as you mature and as you grow older you if you're fortunate and if you if you're looking into yourself and examining yourself that you can eventually come to terms uh, I was alone because I wanted to be alone I was afraid to have people come too close for me uh, to me to f for fear that they might find out what I really was and I didn't think very much of myself you're a thinker aren't you uh, probably too much of a thinker yeah, I'm getting out of that. I'm learning not to think as much. Irresponsible. Responsible? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I try to be, yeah. Because combining the two, you have, and I suppose you've considered this too, quite enormous power. You can reach a lot of people and get your message across to them. Well, I, ha I have the... Uh, yes, I can reach a lot of people and uh, get... It's not so much message, you see. I don't like messages. Uh, messages go by uh, Railway Express or American Telephone and Telegraph. But you can communicate your thoughts to My feelings. People. My feelings. My music is mostly emotional. It's mostly on an emotional level. But let's say you wanted to introduce that into political thinking. You could do it. Emotional, the emotional aspect into a political area? No, take it one step further. If you wanted to get, I know you don't like the word message, but if you wanted to get, communicate your feelings and your thoughts, you can into political areas. I suppose I could, but I, frankly, I've never really been that interested in politics. I, I find most of it, certainly in the United States, uh, very trivial and um, very temporary and... Uh, uh, I find very few real thinkers in American politics or people who really have an understanding of the future and, uh, you know, beyond when the next time they come up for election. You wouldn't uh, get behind a p political candidate and try and help him win? Oh, yes, I have done that. Uh, Teddy Kennedy, isn't it? Well, not so much Teddy Kennedy, although uh, it's possible. Uh, he's asked me if I would do some things for him this year. Very s selective people that I felt that, um, yes, the public should know about these people. Uh, they might have been underdogs, or, or uh, uh, I just felt that these were substantial people, sensitive people who really cared about what they were doing. Well, then, is this where your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings can do a lot more? Well, there is that potential, although um, the reality of it is, is that the public really comes to their own conclusions based on many things, based on what they read in the papers, on television, based on their own instincts. Um, I, I don't think there's anyone with enough power to, uh, to motivate or to, to shape the thinking of a public in a direction other than the, than the public is prepared to think in. And, uh, and you wouldn't try. In other words, say you decided to back Ted Kennedy. Would you try and mould their thoughts? No, I, I, I don't think. That's not what I'd do. I could express my own feelings, um, and uh, I suppose it would be up to people then to reach their own conclusions. How important is money to you? Well, money is uh, reasonably important for, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, I suppose that my background had something to do with it. I never had uh, much exposure to money when I was a kid. Uh, I, <clears throat> I never really missed it, but it was just uh, something that didn't really enter into my life very, uh, very much or very often. Um, but I find that the that that money has two main uh, real functions that that are productive. First, uh, for privacy, which uh, which is important, especially for a writer. 
And the second, because uh, because well, I have. Can I just stop on the head? What do you mean by that? Well, you 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 must buy your privacy when you're a public person. You must live in areas that are that are exclusive, um, uh, simply because you want to go about your your everyday life like everyone else. And uh, if you're too much in front of the public, then you can't do that. Uh, you know, everybody wants their two minutes or their ten seconds. Uh, which seems very small from the individual's point of view, but of course when you realize that there are thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of people who want that time, you must protect that. First comes my work uh, and my family. And what else and does money mean? Money also in a sense means freedom, uh, the freedom to stop performing for three years, the freedom to study and read and to get to know myself. Um, also, it, it, it's... Uh, um, being in the public favor is extraordinary and exhilarating, but it's it's not one of those things that you can count on for the rest of your life. And so you hope that you're able to put enough in the bank so that when the public finally does say, we no longer like you, we like that person, uh, that you do, uh, you don't have to go around and, and work at jobs that, uh, uh, that you don't want to work at, that you can live your life and still maintain some semblance of self-respect. Do you know how much money you now really have? Do you keep a check on what you I, have? I don't really know. Uh, it's, it gets very complicated after uh, uh, after a while. It gets complicated. It's a business, really, and I'm I'm one of the employees of the business. I I receive a salary, um, and uh, but I haven't really concerned myself with money. I it's my understanding that I I have enough to do to live the way I live now, and that's that's right where I want it. Do you spend easily? Yes, I spend very easily. I don't think on yourself. It. Not so much on myself, but when I want something, I get it. Like what? Anything. Uh, new pair of shoes, uh, as many record albums as I want, uh, the best um, hi-fi systems, the best guitars, uh, whatever it is that uh, whatever it is that I want. What about your kids? My kids uh, are. Uh, no, I have to be under. I have to have that under much more control. You see, I'm much more experienced at having no money than at having money, and so I'm just really learning to deal with it. As far as my children are concerned, I try to give them what they need, uh, irrespective of of money. And uh, uh, of course, children with their um, limitless vision want everything that they see, and of course, you can't uh, you can't do that. But you think you should virtually give them what they want? Whatever they need, not what they want, because they want everything. What I think they need, what I think is important to their life. Have you talked to your kids while you've been away? Yes, I spoke to my son just about an hour before the show. What sort of conversation do you have with him? We had a good conversation. He's, uh, he's anxious for me to come home. And uh, I spoke to him for a little while, and I told him about a gift that I got him. And... Uh, can you tell uh, us what that was? Yes, I got him a little pencil box with a secret compartment in it to keep his pencils. And, uh, and then I spoke to, uh, to his mother for a little while, and I wanted to talk to him again, but he was very emotional about it, and he was, he was very tearful and crying, and uh, he wouldn't go back on the phone. So uh, I told him, uh, I told my wife that uh, I'd call back tomorrow and try and talk to him again. Why can't your wife travel with you? She can, and she does occasionally. It's very difficult, and uh, while I'm touring, it's work. It's, uh, it's work, it's very difficult work, and it's very intense, and uh, I find it difficult to be a husband and, uh, and a worker at the same time. I think the two have to be separate, so that when I come home, I can be a father and a husband again without any distractions. Now, women play quite a role in your life, in terms of songs anyway. Yes. I want to talk about perhaps one individual woman where we've just listened to uh, your, one of your bestsellers. So we'll tune in for a moment to Sweet Caroline. Real easy. And then we start to build it together, okay? Okay, here we go. A little clapping. Sounds good.
Who was Caroline? Well, Caroline is probably, uh, I guess, every woman that I've ever met, you know. I don't know if there was a Caroline. Uh, it's a story about a relationship between a man and a woman, and you can use any name that you care to use. It no. so happened that Caroline worked beautifully in the song. So no particular reason, there was no Caroline that you thought of at the time? No. Although subconsciously, you know, it, it's very difficult for me to, uh, to analyze the songs. You know, they come, I try to let them come as freely as possible without intellectualizing on them. I did not ask myself when I wrote that song, who is Caroline? It was the name that came to mind, and so that was, that was good enough reason. Now, a few years later, do you get sick of Caroline? No, I don't. It's one of those songs that uh, have sustained for me. That's one of the beautiful things about songs, is that uh, when, you do, when you do them well, they can sustain you and give something to you for many years, whereas a concert, a performance, it's, it's a thing of the moment. It lasts for a t period of time, and it's exhilarating like no other experience that I experience in my life. But when it's over, it's over. A piece of music, a song, Yes, ten years later, a hundred years later, still. Neil Diamond might have some vices. Yes, of course, I have uh, more vices than we have time to talk about here. Oh, name a couple. <clears throat> well, I'm addicted to cigarette smoking. Uh, I tend to overwork. Uh, those two uh, are, you know, really fit for extended this discussion. Does cigarette smoking cause damage to you, though, particularly yes. in your blood? Yes, it does. I've been warned by my doctors that, uh, that uh, my singing career will be uh, shortened considerably by it. I've tried just about everything. Hypnotism, uh, self-discipline, uh, stopping work, uh, trying other brands of cigarettes, but uh, uh, I'm addicted to them without any question. Show business personalities and drugs are often connected. Yes, that's right. In your life? Uh, they were for a while, uh, to a very limited degree. Um, I don't, uh, I don't like to take any kind of drugs into my body. I prefer not to take even aspirin. I don't drink. Uh, I've hardly had any alcohol in my life. Uh, so there hasn't been very much of a problem in that regard. I don't like taking manufactured things and taking, because I don't really know what they do. And frankly, I don't think anyone else, even the manufacturers, know really what they do. Uh, so the drug thing hasn't been very much of a problem. I think cigarettes are even more of a problem. Do you have any major dislikes? <clears throat> oh, of course, yes. I like, uh, well, my dislikes. I like, ins I dislike uh, insensitive people. Um, I dislike rude people. Uh, hey. I Mm -hmm. Go on. Yes, oh, I, it, I could go on forever. Are you a patient person? Uh, when, when my energy is, is there, I, I can be very patient, but um, when my energy is, goes, and I, I've been able to predict it fairly well, uh, I have no patience at all. I uh, become a whole different personality. I believe one of your likes is flowers. Yes. And from a special fan. Thank you. Who's that Diamond. from? Someone who specially sent it in for you. This is this is, you know, really a perfect creation. You know, I look at a rose and I say, uh, God, if I could ever create a song that were that beautiful, I would, uh, I would never have to have any doubts in my whole life. But this is, uh, this is a perfect creation. Is that why you have a beautiful bouquet or huge setup of flowers on your stage? Um, yes, yes. Which it, is unusual it, for. A person like you. It puts me and what I do in perspective, you know, tendency is very often when you're standing in front of an audience of 20 or 30 or 40,000 people to think, gee, you know, you're really terrific, and you turn around and you look at a rose, it puts you in perspective. Is life a bore? A bore? Mm. Oh no, life is, life is ever changing, ever interesting, ever expanding. Uh, ever incomprehensible and uh, ever wondrous. After the first million, two million or so, what are the goals? After the first million or two million? <laughs> uh, the goals have always been the same. Self-perfection, self-analysis, uh, uh, 
really perfection of myself and to understand what it is that I could contribute and to make that contribution. That always has been the goal and uh, I suspect that it always will be. You're an emotional person? I am, but in very specific times. It, uh, I'm mostly emotional when I'm writing music. I tend to let my emotions go freely when I'm writing and to keep them very much in containment when I'm doing other things. Apparently for a while you needed even medical attention. Was that because of the emotions within you? Medical attention? In what well, respect? In terms of needed help that you, I believe, needed some help at one stage. As to Psychological. Which direction? Yeah. Yes, I spent the last three years with, with an analyst uh, who uh, really helped me change my life because it was an opportunity really for me to begin to speak. I never really did talk very much. I always saved the, the speaking for when I was writing the music. What I had to say came out of the music. And merely sitting and talking with a man three, four, five days a week for years um, gave me the experience and the ability to, uh, to verbalize and to talk, and not the fear of it either. How did you have the right confidence in that particular person? I mean, do you model yourself on anyone in particular? I suppose that there are a number of people that I, I aspire to uh, uh, model myself after. Anyone that we would know, or someone that you've met privately? Um, people that I've met privately. I mean, uh, I meet people all the time, and there are things about people, uh, whether it's a, a driver in this city, or a man that I met in a pub in that city, or the man who does the, the construction work on my home in Los Angeles, who's who's 85 years old and is and has accrued the wisdom that I that I have not nearly uh, come to know. Uh, I learn and I model myself after people that I respect and that I uh, that I like. You're basically happy or sad. Now I'm basically uh, happy because I'm content and fulfilled in my work. I wasn't always happy. I was, there was always that conflict between what you were and what you wanted to be and what you aspired to and what other people thought you should be. And uh, you know, but I've I've come to terms with that to a large degree and. Uh, I know pretty well what I want out of my life, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy now. Clothes are important to you? Clothes? I, I would hardly go anywhere without them. <laughs> On stage, your selection of clothes? Yes, absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Well, you want to feel very special when you go out on a stage before an audience. It's the same way uh, when you go out for dinner with friends. You want to feel good. You want to, you know, and especially on a stage when you have so many people. Color? You, color kind of clothing that you wear. It has to reflect your mood that evening. I never decide on what I'm going to wear until just before the show. Um, it's, uh, yes, it is very important. And uh, has reflected my, my emotional state also. Uh, when I first started to perform, I wore pure black, black boots, black pants, black shirt, black guitar. In a sense, it was a way of hiding behind that, that solid black front of mystery, you know. <clears throat> And uh, as I progressed and uh, um, grew older and began to learn things, it was, it was interesting because the colors kind of changed. I got into lighter colors, and, and now I find it difficult to wear purely dark colors. Neil Diamond, are you a religious person? No. <coughs> it doesn't mean anything to you? <coughs> oh, it means a great deal to me, but I'm not religious. Uh, I tend to be a very spiritual person, but religion, organized religion, uh, is created by people who are fallible and... Um, who do you believe not... in God? Yes, yes. Your children? Do I have children? No, do your children? Is that what you're teaching them? Well, I, I think that uh, they'll have to reach their own conclusions. It's much too important a subject to, for me to inflict on them. I think they'll reach their own conclusions about life when they, as they grow older. They're too young now. Do you fear what's around the corner for you? <clears throat> I did. I did fear it. Uh, I'm not afraid of it now. Uh, I'm willing to accept whatever it is. I'm, I don't expect to. Uh, it's funny, I've had this vision for most of my life that I would not live a very long life, and so I understand that I'm willing to accept that and do what I can within that period. Um, and that was my main fear, death. Will you know when your time has come in show business? Oh, I think I'll know it long before anyone else does. Will you try and hang on, or will you get the message? I'll get the message. And depart, or will you try and... You'll actually get the message and go, or will you try and go on with it? 
Well, you know, there are many other things that can satisfy people. One of my dreams that I've, I've had for many years was to be able to uh, subsidize and to open up a camp for children. When I was a child, I was fortunate enough to be accepted into a, a camp. Um, it was a charity camp, but uh, I went and it exposed me to all kinds of new things. It's one of the things I want to do now with my success. I've been saving money for my concerts now for the last five years. I have a substantial sum put away, and next year my goal is to start buying a piece of land and to build my camp. Have you ever thought of being a factory worker or a bus driver? Uh, of actu seriously, of actually doing it? No. No, I worked with my father when I was young in a shop, and I, I learned very quickly the limitations of that. I spent most of my youth looking out of the shop window at the rest of the world and wondering what was happening. I don't want to do that anymore. Neil Diamond, is that the real name? That's the real name, yeah. No change? No change. Well, I think our time has come. I'd like to ask you now how you felt during the last hour in this sort of interview. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it was relatively painless, but then again, I expected it to be. I heard that you, uh, you were quite bright and did, that you do ha did have a brain to go along with the personality and the looks. Um, Really, the purpose of it was to give some insight beyond the myth so that people didn't only think of me as someone they saw on the front page dashing from the airplane to the limousine to the hotel. Do you feel you've achieved that now, to a certain extent? Uh, I think probably people know me a little better now than they did before. Thank you very much for coming in. It's been tremendous talking to you. Thank you, Michael. Good.